I know um, Reba also had just started his own podcast, which is amazing. So, uh, but feel free to ask them to help you solve any challenge that you, or maybe give it to them as an assignment to think about how they can be part of the solution. But welcome everybody to uh, Janet's Planet Academy this morning. We're excited to have Marie Baja. He is a researcher. He's a professor at University of Austin. He also has his own podcast. He is an advocate for all things sustainable and ways that we can make uh, earth and space better. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'm gonna spotlight your video and take it away. Yeah, uh, great. So um, I think I'm just gonna kind of give people uh, a journey through my own um, my own path into what it is that I do, and I think um, I think that'll that that that'll probably be be good to to generate some discussion and that sort of stuff. So I, it's a pleasure for me to 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 be here with you folks today, and let's see if I can uh, share this. Hopefully, people can see that. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So, um, so yeah, so I, uh, I'm, I'm here at the university of Texas at Austin, uh, just like, uh, um, you know, Janet said more, but associate professor, aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics. Um, lots of, lots of titles of stuff that I do. That's not so important. Uh, but I am going to tell you a little bit more about what it is that I do. So, Let's see. I, at some point, uh, worked for NASA, and I was called the spacecraft navigator. And basically, it was my job to safely get uh, satellites and rovers to Mars. So I did that for a number of years. Uh, I worked on Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, Mars Express, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, uh, Stardust, Hayabusa, and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, I left NASA to work for the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory. They have some facilities in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on an island called Maui. And so I, I lived on Maui for a few years, and it was my job to then focus less on Mars and more on things orbiting the Earth. And this is where I got introduced to uh, our, or, our space debris, our space garbage uh, problem. I've done a number of things like work with other governments, with the US government. Uh, you know, I've briefed people in Congress and the United Nations. So I'm very, uh, I'm very much part of the fabric of the community when it comes to these things. And again, currently I'm, I'm here at uh, the University of Texas at Austin. But let's start from my beginning. So I'm a first generation uh, American. My mother comes from uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. My father from a small town called Pujehun in Sierra Leone. They met in California and, uh, and I, was a, I was a result of them uh, meeting in California. Okay, so first generation American. But you know, like, like some people, um, sometimes parents don't always uh, want to stay with each other. And so my parents decided that they got divorced and uh, my mother met this gentleman from a country in South America called Venezuela. So she, she, she got married to him and um, you can see how happy I am as a teenager sitting on this park bench and uh, and well, you know, they, 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 they had a couple of kids and uh, I moved to Venezuela. So at the age of about six or seven years old, I moved to Venezuela, foreign country to me. I didn't speak Spanish. So it was, a, it was very scary, um, very intimidating. Um, but, you know, eventually children find their way. So, so I was able to do that. For high school, I actually went to a military school in Venezuela. It was a boarding school. So I actually went to school from Sunday evening to Friday evening. And so for five years, uh, I only went home on weekends. 
So pretty much my life was uh, constrained to this Venezuelan military academy. And uh, it, was, it, it, was, it was pretty rough, but uh, you know, 250 people uh, started out with me uh, and 41 people graduated with me after five years. So we, we've become good friends after going wow. through a number of things like that together. Well, you know, I kind of got used to this military life from, uh, from military school. And so I came back to the United States and I enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. So there's me standing next to a vehicle called a peacekeeper. And I was basically... Uh, I was a police officer in the military. I was a security policeman and it was my job to guard nuclear missiles in Montana. So in Montana, there's this U S air force base. It's called Malmstrom air force base. And uh, I spent my enlistment guarding nuclear missiles there. Now, interestingly enough, you know, uh, I told you that, that I kind of grew up in Venezuela and Caracas. Caracas is, um, a pretty big city, millions of people. It has lots and lots of bright lights. And so, you know, when it's nighttime, you don't see a whole lot of stars in Caracas. In fact, on a good night in Caracas, you might see the moon sort of thing. And so I'd never really seen uh, a really, really dark sky before. And when I went to Montana, it's the first time that, I, that I've seen a sky so dark at night. And I started noticing dots of light crossing the sky. And I realized that these dots of light were not airplanes. I realized that these dots of light uh, were not uh, meteors. And that they were actually human-made objects in space. And that is where my curiosity about space, like, solidified. I had to know more about that. It was amazing to me that with my own eye, I could see things that humans had put orbiting the earth. How is that possible? What kept them in orbit? How are these things behaving? So, so, so I had a natural curiosity and somebody told me, hey, if you want to know more about this stuff, you should study this thing called aerospace engineering. Okay. So I left the military after my four years of service and went to this place called Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, the one in Arizona. And um, it was a scary experience. I was older. Uh, many people said that this was not for me. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't good enough. You know, kind of like, uh, you know, when, when, when Yoda said that, uh, you know, Luke, Luke was already too old to begin the training kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's basically what I was told, too old to begin the training. Um, wow. But I decided to just take this leap of faith uh, and, and, and see where that led. And I was able to get through that program. I, uh, this is where I, I was acquainted with NASA as a researcher through the Arizona space grant program. I did some internships, uh, one at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, where the atomic bomb and all that was, uh, was developed uh, in New Mexico. And I started getting acquainted with some of these sciences and engineering, which is basically problem solving. So I was able to graduate with my bachelor's degree. But, you know, I wanted to go further. I felt I need to learn more. I don't know enough. So uh, I was able to get into a program at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and I wanted to study the science uh, about motion of stuff in space, right? How things move and all that. And so I decided, yep, I'm going to try this. And I was able to get in the program. And um, the, the late George Bourne was my advisor. And, um, you know, I wasn't a good test taker, to be honest. I scored pretty low on my graduate uh, exams uh, to get in. And my, 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 my grade point average out of my bachelor's degree wasn't the, the, it was like, you know, 3.2 or something, which for graduate school isn't uh, really that great, um, not competitive. But 
I had shown myself that I could be a decent researcher. Um, I went to a conference to, to, to talk about some of my research and you just never know who's going to be in the audience at any given point. Okay. And, 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 and my, my advisor, uh, the person who was, who was going to be my advisor in graduate school, he was sitting in the front row. And after my talk, I just, I was very passionate and I just kind of laid it all out there and just made myself vulnerable. And uh, he came up to me afterwards and he said, I've never really experienced anything like that before. And you need to be my graduate student. So um, even though I wasn't the, the world's best te test taker and I wasn't a straight A student, I found my way into the University of Colorado at Boulder. He said, um, show me what you got. And, and, and um, one thing in life is um, whenever opportunities uh, come, come, come my way. Um, I've never said no. As scary as, as the opportunities have been, as much as I've told myself that maybe, may, maybe, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not worthy in all these things. I've struggled with that my entire life, but I've just, I've been courageous. And so what I'm going to tell you, here's my definition. My definition of courage is this. Courage is the absence of paralysis in the presence of fear. That means that I'm not fearless. I'm afraid, but I don't let the fear stop me from moving forward. And so that's what I've kind of done along my career. I, um, my dream was to work for NASA, specifically for stuff going to Mars. And I got a call one day somebody from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory that said, you know, I've actually been looking at your resume and I just wanted to know, would you be interested in navigating satellites to Mars? <laughs> uh, let me think. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so um, that was amazing. Uh, uh, and, you know, literally incredible to me. And uh, of course I said, yes. And so I started working for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory on these Mars missions that I talked to you about. And I had never been, uh, I'd, ne I'd never been to Europe or anything like that, right? I mean, I went to South America, that's where I grew up. But, uh, you know, my mother, my mother always made it seem like Europe was like maybe a bridge too far. It was, it was the old world. It was, um, you had to have money and all these resources to be able to, to do such a thing. And one day, my supervisor at NASA approached me and he said, there is a mission that uh, I want to see if you want to work on. But before I even tell you about it, when you work on this mission, you will not be acknowledged publicly that you're on this. So basically... There's going to be no, no news, no press conferences. Uh, people aren't really going to acknowledge that you're working on this. Um, people here at JPL aren't going to care that much that you're working on this thing because it's actually not a NASA mission, but it will challenge you and it will, it will widen your horizons. I, it, it's, do you want to step up to this? And I said, sure. What is it? And, they, and basically, they said, we want you to help Europe have the first successful mission to Mars. So I said, sure. So I worked on Mars Express. Wow. And I helped the Europeans get the satellite to Mars, their first Mars mission. And so this is me in the mission control room at the European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt, Germany. Germany was something that I'd heard in history and these sorts of things. I never thought in a million years that I'd physically be in Europe and um, yeah, helping the European Space Agency um, make, it, make it to Mars. And so I'm standing here with uh, a couple of my fellow spacecraft navigators next to, the, to uh, um, um, an engineering model of the Rosetta spacecraft that rendezvoused with a comet also at the European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt, Germany. And then the folks that worked on Mars Express, I called, I called ourselves the Fantastic Four. And um, 
the unsung heroes that helped Europe get this mission successfully to Mars. So we were behind the scenes working day and night, um, uh, help, helping our, our, our European colleagues. Somewhere along the way, I, um, I, uh, I got a PhD wow. and uh, had some kids. By the way, this was for Halloween. I don't usually dress up this way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyways, this is, this is us on Maui and um, brilliant adventure. Mm. Brilliant adventure. True. Um, you know, left JPL on Maui, worked for the Air Force Research Laboratory. This is me and, uh, at the time, Lieutenant Governor Duke Iona talking about how Maui can make a contribution to understanding the space garbage problem and quantifying this and tracking all these objects. And I'm going to show you all these things here in a little bit. I was also, uh, you know, in these European trips, interestingly enough, um, one of the people back in like the 1600s that came up with a lot of the theories for how planets move and all that stuff was, uh, you know, this, this gentleman called Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler. And they were in Prague uh, in what's currently known as the Czech Republic uh, today. And um, so this is me in Johannes Kepler's house. Like hundreds of years later, I learned about how stuff moves in space. And, and, and these people were part of the folks that laid that foundation. And um, just that amazing circle going from looking at dots across the night sky guarding missiles to uh, standing in this person's house. Um, along in Europe, I was able to meet with colleagues at different universities. Here I'm, I'm with the chief scientist of the, of the U.S. Air Force uh, at the time, working on some, some of my research and uh, uh, exploring ways to collaborate with each other. Uh, here I am uh, leading, uh, leading a group in NATO, working on better understanding stuff in space and how we can make sure that uh, we don't get into any sort of space wars or anything like that. I had the opportunity at the United Nations to meet the, the first person who, who ever did a spacewalk. Um, he recently passed away, uh, Alexei Leonov from, from Russia. And uh, he gave a, a great talk and he saw me at the time I had dreadlocks. Uh, I don't, I don't today, but uh, he saw me, he said, I like your hair. And I said, I'd like a selfie. He said, yes. So we did that. Uh, so that was a great, great moment with him. And then I left uh, the government and I came here to the University of Texas at Austin to start my own research group, really focusing on space traffic, space garbage problems. And so I've been meeting with people that care about this problem. Here I am with folks from NASA, Air Force, DARPA, IARPA, and um, Congresswoman uh, Martha McSally. People who lead the Federal Aviation Administration and the Department of Defense in these affairs as well. Here I am with um, you know, Congresswoman uh, Martha McSally. This is with uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein. I testified to Congress with, uh, invited by Senator Ted Cruz. Here's Congressman Brian Babin as well in the House. People in Australia care about this problem as well. I've given some TED Talks. So let's talk about the problem now, okay? Uh, this idea of you know, space sustainability and all that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's see, 
stop that. And what I think I can do here, let's see. Laura, but if I can just say one thing. Yeah. It's like your story is so compelling. And one of the things that we have been talking to everybody about is that if you want to be in the space industry, it's not just about being an astronaut. You can be you can be a technical engineer, you can be an aerospace engineer, you can navigate things, you can draw things, you can create things. And but the other thing is, and we heard this from a, a, a woman yesterday, that it's like she created her the degree she wanted. There was not a path forward for the things she wanted to do, and she literally created it. So, mm -hmm. guys, when you listen to my dear friend's story, think about he overcame many challenges, but he kept going because he knew in his heart and soul that's where he wanted to be, and he has met with an uncommon success. It's like again you cannot discount every one of these amazing things he's been involved in what a success and again was it easy i am going to guarantee it most certainly was not at times and those times that people told him nope 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 and still and all and thank god for whomever you met at that conference who said yes and so your job in this world as you go about is to find that person who will say yes no matter how many no's you get there is somebody out there willing to say a yes to you so you keep looking for those yeses but congratulations uh, Laura Buff. Mwah. amazing yeah. thank Good you thank you time. thank you thank you yeah so so the thing that i want to do is i want to share kind of a current space traffic map of uh you know what's going on and so hopefully people can see that and uh this is this is the current view this is uh um a collection of observations of stuff in space from several sources and basically what we're looking at is every single dot is something that humans created in one way or another orbiting the earth right now uh you know, opinions from different people about these things and uh, lots of dots, right? And these things are in different orbits. Um, this is, you know, based on, on the current time, like I said, uh, interestingly enough here, there's kind of like, you can barely make it out, but it seems like there's a, like a train of some, some, some objects. You can see some dots that are basically, um, like one after the other here, we're going to zoom in a little bit. And uh, these are the, these, these, uh, I'm pretty sure, let's see, see if I can click on one of those. Yeah, so it's part of Elon Starlink's satellites, the train, train of satellites. Uh, it's probably a fairly re recent launch. And so you can kind of see how far from the Earth's surface this orbit is. It's, fair, it's, it's what's called low Earth orbit. So it's fairly close to the Earth, just like several hundred uh, kilometers, several hundred miles up. You can see a couple more of, of these like dots. This is another set of Starlinks. This right here is another set of Starlinks that you can kind of see there. So uh, they're, they're definitely populating low Earth orbit. Here's another train of Starlinks that you can see <laughs> crisscrossing right there. So yeah, each one of these things uh, you know, is orbiting the Earth, going going at uh, roughly about uh, seven seven kilometers per second. So here you have the speed; it's about seven point seven kilometers per second. Just to give you an idea, that's that's almost eight times the speed of a bullet. That's how fast these things are moving across the sky. And as you can see, there's just uh, stuff in different different orbits. Uh, some are fairly far away. Let's see this this, uh, this ring that you see. Um, this outer ring is what's called the geostationary belt. Basically, it, it's a it's a place where you put a satellite there, and it takes it about a full day, 24 hours, for it to go around once. So it's a good place to put things like communication satellites and that sort of stuff. And so let's see if I can uh, find find. Let's see. Let's let's search for. See, let's go for um, Galaxy 15 as a favorite. So yeah, so here's this gives you an idea. Here's the Galaxy uh, Galaxy 15, and it's at it's in this kind of Goldilocks 
uh, geo belt so you can kind of see how far away that orbit is. It's that, that one's about 36,000 kilometers away from the Earth's surface. Uh, you can see this string of pink pearls right there. Unfortunately, all these objects were generated from an explosion of a rocket body, an, 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 a dead rocket body that put a satellite in orbit. It, this thing exploded. And so when, when, when rocket bodies explode, they become many, many smaller pieces. So they, they, they cause space pollution. That's pretty much what this is. All of these, all of these dots came from one single object. Um, and there's like up more than 50 of these rocket bodies uh, that are just at any point in time, they could explode and create more trash. So that's, that's not so good. And in terms of, uh, you know, things crisscrossing each other in space, uh, what this plot here is showing is just the number of objects that are coming within six miles of each other in the next 20 minutes. That's a lot. Uh, that's a lot of objects that are crisscrossing each other um, you know, on these, on these orbital highways. So, uh, and the problem is not getting any better. So the thing is we need to raise awareness and, um, you know, work together to try to make sure that we can prevent, um, more of this space garbage from being created. And, um, yeah, I, uh, one, one, one other thing that I, I think I want to, to find here and share is is a movie that um and one other question somebody brought it up or you uh, you may know him hussein bakari uh spoke to us on monday and mm. showed us a bit of how many of those satellites are basically non-working or defunct correct it's like from the 1950s there's a good part of those things up there oh, yeah. as well it's that like... are no longer working correct oh yeah, and so niara it's... Do you have a question, baby? What's your question, hun? It's not a question. Um, I just know something. If um, people send stuff into space, um, like rockets, and sometimes they don't have that much electricity to um, to get all the way in space, sometimes they blow up. Right, and then that creates that problem as uh, our friend here was telling us about. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. So yeah, so, 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 so um, yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna share one more thing here and then I can kind of, so hopefully people can see this. And what this is gonna show you is it's a movie. All these tiles are, areas of the sky that astronomers care about to see very dim objects, distant objects. And you're going to see a bunch of lines going through here. Each one of these lines is some human made object that is reflecting sunlight towards the ground. And, 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 and so this is a single night at a, at a telescope in Chile in, in South America, just so that you can see the amount of traffic, and wow. clutter that astronomers have to deal with every night just to try to see things that aren't human made uh, in space. And uh, in this plot, the, the moon and the sun location are here, but basically this is the direction that the telescope is pointed to. And so it's like, uh, this, is, this is going from, this is around sunset and as the sun sets, uh, and you go into night, then you see less things, not because they're not there, but because these things are going through Earth's shadow, they're being eclipsed by the Earth, so they're not reflecting sunlight as much. Only things that are in higher orbits that aren't eclipsed are reflecting sunlight. And then you're gonna see that as, as this uh, progresses, we're gonna go uh, you know, midnight, and then it's go you're gonna see the swarm start um, you know, forming again uh, you know, as, as, as night starts disappearing and we go towards sunrise, uh, you're going to see a bunch of, a bunch of these human made objects that are starting to reflect sunlight as well. And so this is, and this is based on the current number of, uh, you know, satellites and debris and all that stuff that are 
uh, that are in orbit. So it, it, it's, it's that whatever the trackable population is, that's what we have kind of represented here. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not getting better and astronomers are definitely unhappy. And, um, but, you know, we, we, we keep on launching things because we're trying to get more services and capabilities like internet and, um, you know, uh, timing services and all this other stuff. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately about 96% of all the stuff up there, uh, is garbage. So, and, and, and there's no, there's no way to really fully clean all that stuff. So that's part of the problem. So we have to try to find ways to not generate more of it. But, um, anyway, I'll just, uh, I'll stop there. I mean, that is, I mean, that is, that puts it into perspective, maybe more so than anything that I've seen of where astronomers are wanting to look. I, I know that, you, so what is the answer? So if we can't mitigate or somehow recycle or create some space magnet, what, what should we be thinking about doing? What are the other alternatives or is it? Yeah, so, 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 yeah. So the thing is, I believe that we, I believe that we can mitigate, but, um, Part of the problem uh, is that um, I'd say half half of the people or even more just don't comply with the mitigation guidelines. Ah, gotcha. And so, but and 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 so the question is, how do we incentivize people to actually follow these guidelines? Because they're not they're not law; they're just suggestions. Oh, I thought if you launch because, you know, working with Naeem with IBM and him wanting to do his CubeSat process, we knew that we had to file the FCC papers about the, you know, the basically the burn at the end of its time up there. So you're right. saying it's not something like people can say they will, but they don't. It's a suggestion. Exactly. That's right. So would that take space law or what would that what would that well, entail? Yeah, so, so I think I think it takes space law, but it also takes be the ability to monitor people's behavior so that you know when they're breaking the law and when 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 that's not happening and so i i would say by and large most of what happens up there or what people can do is unmonitored scary <laughs> a little yeah. bit yeah right so is this the kind of thing i mean what questions do you have for these young students what could they think about or Guys, do you have any ideas of how we might? Well, so so the, the thing that I would pose to to uh, to these to these to these young young and and enthusiastic uh, human beings is, can we can we come up with uh, behaviors that go beyond? cultural boundaries and these sorts of things. Can we find a way to work together as one humanity to, to avoid making space something that we can't use anymore? Uh, can we find a way as a humanity to behave in a sustainable way? Um, even when we are born and raised in different countries and speak different languages and have different beliefs, can we still find a way to come together for a common good, for a common purpose, can we can we find ways to to act from a place of compassion? And guys, that is what being a good crewmate here on Spaceship Earth is all about: is finding a way to unite and do good in this world. If we were to pose this question, anybody out there want to offer? Adia, I know you're a great thinker. Jesse Ryland, Wyatt, Tristan, anybody, Judah. Jesse, you, you have an idea about how we could mitigate any of this, my dear? We could start We could start having more, like, law enforcement in a way, like, send up more law enforcement into the ISS, into space, really get these, this mitigation rule bat down and really crammed into the brains more. <laughs> all right. All right, man. I like it. Yeah. Judah? Niara, Abby, anything? All right, Niara, you have something? Thank you, Jesse. No, I was just going to say, um, 
that I think I can't hear one of you. Oh. It's either Miss Janet or um or some someone else. Hmm. Interesting. We're gonna have to find your audio setting somehow. Um, Abby, anybody else? Unmute there, Abigail. Did you raise your hand, hon? Well, I think this is like, I mean, especially in the case of World Space Week, one of the things, and you hear the airplanes going over now, uh, is finding. You're muted, Janet. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's like satellites do indeed improve our lives. Uh, the benefit is bandwidth in areas that might not have internet service, but it's like they're also going to interrupt our ability to go out and view the stars because we'll have all of these bright, bright things up there that will be decreasing our ability to see the heavens, correct? Right. And what, oh, Tristan says privately, he wants to create like a huge net to scoop up space trash. I think, I think that's, that's not a bad idea. And in fact, some people in Europe uh, did that and they showed it there's something on YouTube that shows kind of this net thing. So, yeah. All right. So you're thinking in the right way. Adia, I saw your hand go up. Do you want to ask your question? Yes. Go ahead, baby. Um, there's a lot of satellites from different countries. So how do you manage? Like, what if they bump or collide into each other? How do you manage that? Good question. Yeah. So, so the thing is when they, when they, bump or collide into each other they become many many smaller pieces and that's a problem that's one of the things that we want to avoid as much as possible thank you thank great question sweetheart evie i saw your hand raised Do you want to unmute and ask your question yeah, yeah um so what my family did was with the plastic spoons and stuff like we got a bunch of people to sign it and like so that way people like um so that way, like, they made it, like, like, in a, you could get a bunch of people to sign some sort of contract, like, say, like, 100 people sign a contract to make a law. So, like, a petition or a law. So, Maggie and Evie, you guys are advocating for kind of a worldwide kind of, like, agreement or a contract that we would, I mean, because, like, my guess is it's, like, they're, everybody's got their reasons for putting their satellites up there. Would there ever be a conceivable way that we could, countries could join together and say, we're all going in on this particular satellite and we will all draw information from there? Or is there just such proprietary stuff people want that that would never happen, right? Am I looking at too much of a utopia there that would, that would never happen? Yeah, I mean, so, so I mean, part of the work with, you know, what we were doing at UT with Astrograph is to head in that direction in terms of people signing up to stuff, I mean, at the United Nations, uh, you know, Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space, that's exactly what 93 countries did, is they signed a petition to, to abide by these debris mitigation guidelines, but they're not, they're not enforceable. And so, uh, because they're not legally binding. So there's still suggestions. So the question is, even when people sign up to it, how do you incentivize them to actually follow through. And, and, and I believe the answer from my perspective is um, you, can't, you can't enforce something that you don't know and you don't know something that you don't measure. So for me, it's all about measurements and putting the evidence uh, in, the, in, the, in the eye of the public and basically showing people who is, who, 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 who is following this stuff and who isn't. to take what do you see as i mean what's the incentive there is it public pressure is the incentive to do better is that it or is it if you do this there's a prize how do you what what's what's that incentive you know what's that thing that you yeah give so i'm gonna i'm you know for me it's it's putting public pressure on that's 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 what i can do i don't have money to pay anybody so i what I can do is I can make things very public and then let let the public have an opinion about what they what they think about that. 
Gotcha. Jesse, I see your hand raised and then we'll come to you, Niara. Jesse, go right ahead. I had an idea to like enforce the sort of mitigation law. Stop putting the brand in space and we'll give you a free satellite. <laughs> but that interesting. only interesting, but then it's like then that when they want to launch that satellite, so I, yeah, keep thinking on that one. Keep thinking on what could be that. I like the public pressure because public pressure can sometimes really right the ship. Niara, right. what is your what is your idea or suggestion or comment? I was going to say we could convince people. Convince people. We're trying for sure. And guys, this is one of the messages that you can share with your grown-ups, right? Is that and maybe it's going out when there's a clear night and looking up and seeing. It's like I know a, a, a student in the afternoon classes, his dad can always spot the, the satellites. But see how much, you know, we already know how much light pollution from a city uh, can cause you not to really see the depth of the stars and the constellations in the Milky Way. But again, I don't think in 20, 30, 50 years from now, you guys want to have your kids walking out the door and they can't tell the night sky except from satellites, right? So again, unfortunately, your forebears have once again given you a huge problem um, that to solve and to be part of that solution. Any last words uh, or anybody else want, or Jack, I see you have uh, unmuted your screen. Do you wanna share an idea you have? No. All right, Abby, I see your hand. Do you, you want to ask a question or a comment before we say our goodbyes? No, I just wanted to say thank you for class. Thank you for the talk. That's very kind. Thank so you any very much. Last, yeah. Any last words to these um, young genius minds I've got on here this morning? Yeah, so... so uh, for me, ho hopefully what people have been able to to get from this, aside from understanding, uh, you know, the space traffic problem and all that is don't let any single person's opinion become your reality. Lots of other people have opinions about you and what your life can be and all that other stuff. And really, it's up to you. And just like Janet said, uh, yeah, there may be a lot of no's out there but uh, there's at least one person uh, that will say yes and just persevere and uh, dream, dream big, dream big. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you're really intent on, on, on achieving something, then it's very, very possible. Um, and yeah, just, just, just honor, honor and respect yourself in this process. Be kind to yourself. Uh, and yeah, don't just let somebody else's opinion of you be, be, become uh, your opinion of yourself. No. So beautiful. Thank you so much for being with us. Everybody unmute and say thank you. And we will bid you good day. Good, sir. All right. Um, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. <laughs> Miss Janet, do do you still want to stay on and hear some of my book? I do. I'll have about fifteen minutes right. to do that. So um, let me find my book. I had it. What? So that, actually, what is that? I've actually been experimenting with a new way of coloring. It's, oh yeah. It's it sort of like here's a do show, do show. It's like you outline the color. Oh, can you can you spotlight? Uh huh. Interesting. <laughs>